I'm a teacher. I'm a high school English teacher. I've been teaching for 19 years. And as a teacher, I do the things that you would probably expect a teacher does, right? I plan lessons, I think about my kids, I stay up late, I grade tons and tons of papers. But I also do things that you might not know teachers do, like get up in the middle of the night and worry about my students, or remember all of their birthdays, or do the work of teaching in the places that you might um, that you might not expect it, right? I teach in the margins of their papers. I teach in the hallways, in between classes. I teach in the emails that they send me when they don't quite understand their grade, right? In 2010, um, a group of my former students secretly got together and did this thing. They nominated me for this award that for whatever reason came to fruition. And so in 2010, I was named the National Teacher of the Year, which meant I got to do some pretty cool things, right? Like I got to go to the White House. I got to give President Obama a hug, which I thought was pretty wonderful. <laughs> I got to give a speech in the Rose Garden. I got to take my babies with me, all of these things, right? Which is, you know, it was, is, was an amazing experience. But I have to tell you, there's more to it than that. During this year, when I was plucked out of my classroom and spent the whole year traveling around the country and the world being an ambassador for education, never once did I feel like I was the best. Never once did I feel like I had won anything or I was a queen of some pageant. I always felt a lot more like a poet. Like my job was to have the right words at the right time, all of the time. But of course, there would be times when I couldn't find them. I remember this one afternoon, it was early in the year, and I was at a conference and this kind of distant colleague of mine came up to me and he kind of said in these hushed tones, he said, Sarah, I just, I, I gotta tell you, I, I don't know what happens for you after this. Like, what happens now? You're at the top. Like, what, are you just gonna fall off? Like, what, you know, what, what happens after this? What he didn't understand, what a lot of times we don't understand about stories, is that was the surface story. That wasn't the real story. I'm here today to tell you the real story that starts a little similar to the first one. I am a high school English teacher. I've been teaching high school for 19 years. But really, I'm a story holder. I collect them. I take care of them, and people tell me their stories. The, the kids in my classes, adults, children, and more often than you would expect, complete strangers tell me their stories. Story holding is an interesting business because if you want to be a story holder, there are some things that you have to be willing to do. The first thing is that you have to be willing to hold it. The second thing is that you have to forego judgment. There's no judgment when you hold people's stories. And you have to be willing to see what's underneath. But more importantly than anything, when you are a story holder, you have to change the question you ask. Instead of asking, what are you doing? You have to look at somebody and look them in the eye and really mean it when you say, how are you? Really, how are you? That's what it means to be a story holder. I'm gonna ask you to hold my story for the next 15 minutes or so. But like any good teacher, I'm gonna give you some reasons why first. All right, I'm gonna tell you why we're gonna do this. Um, so I am sure that you all, if I asked you, think of that teacher, right? You have, if I just say that teacher, the, the face pops into your head, right? You can see this person. The, the one who was transformative for you, the one that made this huge difference for you, one of those for me is sitting right here. Um, I'm sure just as quickly you can imagine the other teacher, right? <laughs> the, the other one, the other side of that spectrum. I will tell you, for all of the research that I could cite and the examples that I can give you, I think we really end up with two kinds of teachers we end up with the kinds of teachers 
who want to give you answers and tell you how to do things, and the kind who really want to teach and ask questions. Today I'm going to tell you a few things, but more than that, I'm going to ask you some questions. And as we do this, I want you to do what I do for my students when I hold their stories, which is also work on reading my own. You also need to be able to hold this story today because teaching is unique. Teaching is humanity's profession, which means you will inevitably be on either side of teaching. You will be taught and you will teach, right? You might need a doctor someday, but you won't necessarily be one. You will probably need art in your life, but you won't necessarily be an artist. We're all probably gonna need a mechanic. Doesn't mean we're all gonna be one. But everybody teaches, whether you mean to or not, whether you realize it or not. You can teach kindness or intolerance in the grocery store line. You can teach compassion or frustration at the dinner table. Everybody teaches. Which is not to say everybody does the complex, deliberate work of teaching professionals, right? Because this is really complex, deliberate work. And I'm going to tell you a little secret about it. You want to know what the hardest part about it is? Maybe the most important part? It's the absorption. Teachers absorb. They absorb learning stories. It's why Tyler loves to read and Rachel doesn't. It's why Katie can write for days and Alyssa can hardly get a single word out, right? That's, that's what teachers do. They absorb all of those things. So I have to tell you that as a teacher, I had been conditioned to look for the smallest of things, right? So we're going to go back to high school English, right? I had been conditioned to look for the difference between like the comma and the semicolon. Why would the po poet use the comma and not the semicolon, right? Or, you know, why, um, you know, why these ducks on this pond in this chapter of this, you know, of this book, I would look at the smallest of things. And let me tell you, my students and I, we did some beautiful work when we looked at really small things. We really did. But the problem with looking at small things is that it precludes you from the most important question. Right? I wasn't able to ask the most important questions. And what I found out was I couldn't ask those questions because I was too small outside of my classroom. I felt whole in my classroom, but outside of it, I felt like this small little circle had been drawn around me, and for some reason, I obeyed it. So 2010 happens, right? This year happened. And then I return to my classroom. And let me tell you about my classroom. It's the, I, I swear, not a day is predictable except the first day, right? Because on the first day, I always know what happens. They come in, I take attendance, we push the desks to the side, we sit in a circle on the floor, I turn off the lights a little bit, I light a candle, they look at me, they get a little freaked out, I tell them it's gonna be okay. I hand them a copy of Plato's Allegory of the Cave. And I give them one question. Can you tell me, by the end of today, what this class is all about? And we sit there, and we read, and we talk. I don't give them a syllabus. I don't tell them about the rules. I let them think. So I'm doing this, right? So here it is, August 15th, 2011, the day that's supposed to be really predictable. I've done this 10 times, 12 times, I don't know. All of a sudden, I'm reading this essay. You, maybe we should do a little review of the essay. If you don't know about Plato's, this would be important. If you don't know about Plato's allegory of the cave, it's this wonderful metaphor about these 
people who live inside of this cave, they're these prisoners who've been chained in there. Their entire lives, all they've seen are these shadows across the wall on the other side. But they think they're real because they've never seen anything but shadows. Until eventually one of the prisoners is released, goes into the light, says, hey, those are shadows. This is light. This is the real thing out here. Comes back in, they don't want to believe him, right? And all of this pain and agony ensues. So I'm reading this, and the words start to get caught in my throat a little bit. And I can't, I can kind of barely get through it. So I do, I get the kids out the door. I go to my desk in the back corner of the room. I turn out the light and I sit there and I sob. Because I realize this story was turning on me. This essay was my story suddenly. I had been in a cave and then I was out of it and now I was back in it. And somehow that afternoon, I knew that I was going to lose some of my best colleague friends. I knew that the toughest work was ahead of me on some visceral level. I knew that it was a good chance my marriage was not going to make it. And I did what any resistant learner does. I wiped the tears off my face. I put a smile on instead. I went home. I made dinner. I put my babies to bed. I planned the lesson for the next day. And I carried on. Here's the thing. This didn't happen to me just once, right? This kept happening to me over and over again. And this question that teachers have to wrestle with but rarely talk about started appearing for me. What happens when we are supposed to be superheroes but we really just feel superhuman? How do you teach in that moment? How do you teach when your life's work is to give and you are suddenly empty? I found that it was the literature that somehow gave me these answers by asking really good questions, right? So literally, it's like teabag wisdom, right? That the lessons we most need to learn keep showing up for us over and over again until we're willing to learn them. And that's what happened. So just, I don't know, so this happened in August, right? So then just a couple months later, we we're reading this poem. It's called The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which sounds lovely, but there's really no love song at all. It's horribly ironic, and it's really this horribly sad, depressing poem about this businessman who's really lonely, and he kind of trades his authentic, real life for this life of security. Um, and so as we are reading this poem, um, there's a line that we always go back to. We, just, we always unpack it and figure out how it connected to all the small things. Do I force the moment to its crisis? Do I force the moment to its crisis? We said this. We talked about it. And as I'm saying it, I realize Prufrock is talking to me. He's saying to me, do you have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? Because really what this question is about is this question is about space. Courage in crisis is about space. It's about the space from anywhere you are to anywhere you want to be. It's the space between security and possibility. And this is where teachers live. Teachers live in gaps, and cracks, and spaces, and fear. Because if we live in spaces of right and wrong, it's too easy to get stuck in either one of those boxes. There's no reason to struggle. There's no reason to cross the swamp. We don't learn if we're comfortable. We don't change unless we have to. So I'm, I made a promise to, to jail for proof rock. I said, okay, I will pay attention. I'm not going to do anything about this, but I will start to pay attention. So I did. Speed ahead several months later. I'm with my sophomores. We're reading this wonderful book called 
The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. And it begins with this beautiful premise that we all have a personal legend and the people who truly love us want it for us. And you know, it's this wonderful idea that if we really love someone, we let them go. We let them go to go answer their biggest questions all on their own. But here's the thing about J. Alfred Prufrock. He also has this premise, this really heartbreaking premise that, excuse me, Paulo Coelho has this really heartbreaking premise that when people get really close to what he calls a personal legend, they don't take it. They can see it, they can feel it, they can touch it, they can hear it, and they don't take it. And it's because they don't think they deserve it. I read this paragraph over and over again. I read that question, do you believe you deserve it? 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 Do you believe you deserve it until it finally became, do you believe you deserve your best life? That was the question he asked. Nine months later, we're reading, and well, this is why it's a really tough question to ask, right? It's a really tough question to ask if you deserve your best life when you have three children and a mortgage and a name and an image and what seems like everything to lose. Nine months later, I had to put my scared toes on the ledge, right? Put it on the ledge of my marriage. And you know what I did at that moment? You know who I called? From a bathroom stall, I called a teacher. I relied on a teacher. And from her hospital bed, this is what she said to me. She said, you can do what you must. As loud as that question was in my head, do you deserve your best life? Her answer was right there. You can do what you must. We read The Glass Menagerie, this wonderful play um, about these three characters who are stuck in this horrible situation. Um, a mother stuck in the past, a daughter paralyzed by her fear, a son who's got to get out. At the end of the play, the son finally leaves. He leaves the family. I'm sitting in class, we're having this conversation, we're having the discussion we usually have, and Olivia slams her hand down on, the, on, the, on her desk and says, who does this Tom think he is? What does he think he's doing? How selfish could somebody possibly be? And in this moment, I've got to have one of these teacher moments, right? Because I also have had to ask myself these questions. The kids don't know this is going on in my personal life. But I know that I've had to confront the same things that Tom had to confront. And in doing that, I really had to ask a different question. I, had, I, I got to do what teachers get to do when you start to earn empathy. I got to ask a better question. I asked Olivia, I said, well, what if Tom was actually saving all of them by leaving? Is it better, Would it ha wouldn't, ha wouldn't it have been better or easier to just stay and live a half-life? We had a discussion as a class that didn't reduce characters and didn't, and didn't talk about judgment. Instead, we opened up to the possibility Almost a year later, I'm reading The Great Gatsby with my kids. So I got this thing. I don't know. Do you have the thing with your family where like, you can say mean things about your family, but nobody else can? All right, so I kind of have that thing with books. And Great Gatsby was one of those books for me, right, where I was a little, a lot tough on The Great Gatsby. Daisy was pretty, pretty wispy. Nick was pretty entitled and whiny. Gatsby was just really melodramatic, but these were the ones that seemed to come after me the most. So we are reading The Great Gatsby, and I have this new approach, though, right? I have this new approach because this has been happening over, it's been like champagne in my face every day. You know, like all of these things that we're reading are just like splashing me in the face. And so we're reading Gatsby, and I, and I think, what is this book really about? I think it's about narrative. What happens if we can reread the stories that we have in front of us? 
So that's actually what I did. I took a copy of The Great Gatsby and I took the words and I tried to reread them. I turned Great Gatsby into a collection of found poems. And when I got to the last page, I knew this was gonna be a hard page for me before I started. I got to this paragraph. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year we see before us. It, delu it eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther, and one fine morning. So we beat on boats against the current, borne ceaselessly back into the past. I didn't know how to reconcile the past and the future, but I took to this last page to do it, and this is what I came up with. And as the moon rose higher, the inessential began to melt away until I became aware of presence and believed it. There are some lessons I needed to learn. The universe is not outside us. It is within us. It is why we must do the thing we fear. It is why we need stories so that we do not get caught in the vortex of our own. The lesson I didn't want to learn was that I had to crawl out of my cave to get closer to the teacher my students deserved. They did not deserve a National Teacher of the Year. They deserved a teacher who understood that the best way to teach humans is to be one. I tell them that stories and literature should change them, and I think that they should. When we look at the smallness and can contend with that, suddenly we can see the vastness. When we hold stories, in the end, we teach wisdom. Thank you for holding mine. I hope you will risk letting someone hold yours so that others may learn.